Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Gotham City. I'm your host, Levy Rosman. This is a podcast where I talk to people who live in the chess world on the 64 squares and also beyond them. And in this episode, I'm really excited to be speaking with John Bartholomew. Uh, he is a super popular international master, uh, probably the nicest guy uh, in the world of chess, potentially tied with Eric Rosen. Uh, he is a professional chess teacher. He is one of the original uh, employees and founders of Chessable, the really popular platform. Uh, and we talk about everything in the chess world. But before we get into the conversation, I do just want to say, John is still accepting students. You will have to go to his YouTube page and find his email address. But if you are interested in a chess coach, you should definitely reach out. I hope you enjoy the podcast. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, and I told you I, I don't know i might edit that part in because it was very funny the first thing that we said to one another but uh yeah you have a <laughs> really really good microphone and you told me that your student hooked you up with that is that a yeah that that's correct and uh, i assume we're live now by the way so yes. i wanted to just give like a, a warm shout out to uh levy's audience gotham chess gotham city uh thank you very much for having me on first and foremost before i forget um yes so my, a student of mine recommended this mic. I think it's a pretty popular podcasting mic. You see a lot of people like on YouTube and whatnot uh, using these microphones. And I'm only like moderately tech savvy. So I'm glad that I just want to like set it and forget it, right? Like that's ultimately the goal for us content creators, I think. Why I have this. Uh, well, I guess you see me on that webcam. But yeah, I, I mean, I just have a mic that stands on my desk that has a sticker on it that says the daily grind. <laughs> yeah, and it works great for you, right? It sounds good. Yeah, but you, you know, the the Shure is uh, is amazing. I know, I know, Hikaru has it, for example. I don't know what other creators have it actually. Uh, I think Eric Rosen uses it as well. I'm pretty sure oh, I've seen him use it too. Did he upgrade to it? Because I know he used to have this little the ball. It was like a little uh -huh. tiny little thing. But um, yeah, we we chess people we're not we're not super savvy uh, with this stuff. Uh, it's it can be a serious pain to set it all up, and also it's chess. We don't have to sound good. It's we just, you know it's never been a thing. We just got to play good moves. And um, I was the fir very very first thing that I wanted to ask you is uh, I feel like no one really knows your day to day. That might be already uh, maybe a little too personal. But like when uh. I think of you, I thought you were you're you're not playing in tournaments as actively as you once were, and you don't stream as much. And I thought all that time went into running uh, Chessable. But you just told me not quite. So, what is a what are you up to nowadays? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question to clarify <laughs> for sure. Um, so mainly, I'm a chess teacher, and I've been doing chess full time for uh, pretty much ten years now. So I, I started in 2011, um, and I've been pretty much I consider myself to be a chess teacher uh, throughout all that and and to today as well. So I have done, of course, YouTube and Twitch, and I played tournaments, uh, tried to get my Grandmaster title in the past. Uh, speaking of Chessable, so Chessable was a company that I co-founded in 2015 with a guy named David Cramley. Uh, shout out to David if he happens to watch this. And um, he was the man when it comes to that company. It was his baby. It was his idea from the beginning. Um, I actually ran into him because he contacted me on YouTube back when I had um, less than 5,000 subscribers, I think. So this was like very early days when I started posting on YouTube. I think I was posting for about a year at the time he got in touch with me. And we just hopped on a Skype call. He sent me a message saying, hey, I've got this potentially cool idea I haven't seen done in the chess world before. Would you be willing to check it out? There might be a business idea there. So we hopped on a call. He showed me the prototype of the website. And I thought it was pretty mind blowing. Um, Chessable is a platform where you can use spaced repetition and scheduling to uh, improve your chess, learn openings, tactics, end games. And uh, of course, we could go deeper into that. But basically, that was a, a multi year journey that culminated in us selling Chessable to Magnus Carlson's company, <laughs> yeah. Play Magnus. Yeah. <laughs> and that was in 2019. And uh, although I have been involved in Chessable off and on, uh, it's never been my full time gig. I've always been uh, just someone helping out, especially in the early days of the company, getting it up and running, initially promoting it, marketing it. But uh, David was always the go-to guy handling the vast majority of the day-to-day -day business and growing the company. So I feel very lucky to be involved in that. But yes, I am not involved in Chessable um, full-time in any capacity. I'm just a, 
I'm now a shareholder in uh, the parent company, Play Magnus, and a content cr- contributor when I can be. When you when you came on board, were you salaried or you just took like a equity and to, to yeah. help it kind of grow? You, you had yeah, some pretty equity. much just the equity deal. Um, and I have produced some courses on the site. I'm yeah. very happy about that. And I use the site every day. Um, there's a feature where people can comment on any position that they're studying in a chessable course. So you get an automatic notification as a content creator when someone uh, comments on a given position like, hey, what, what am I supposed to play in this position in your Scandinavian defense repertoire? And that's a nice way to engage with the community. I'm constantly doing that sort of stuff and drilling my moves on chessable too. Uh, do you have, uh, you, me- you mentioned uh, you're a shareholder, so you, you can technically share your shares on the Norwegian stock market. Is that how that works? Or Yeah, so Play Magnus is the parent company. Right. Um, and it's listed on one of the Norwegian exchanges. Okay. And yeah, I'm a, a shareholder. I should, I should say that right off the bat, um, that I am a shareholder in the parent company. And um, that's, that's so my, cool. my main like, uh, interaction, I would say, in the company nowadays. Um, from any sort of like managerial role. Do you get to like vote on things as well? You have, uh, or, or not, not, not really, you kind of let, it's in, it's in other people's hands now, basically. Well, uh, as a shareholder, you do just like, um, you know, if you own shares in like a company listed on an American exchange, you may occasionally get a message notification about some sort of vote or a proxy vote. So it, it's that sort of thing oh, as okay, a okay. normal it's shareholder. Not like- it's not like you, you're you one quarter of the final decision, but- you, Oh, no, I'm not okay, on the okay. board. No, nope, I have okay. no influence in any uh, sort of management decisions. No. I, that's, that's so, okay. I, di- I didn't realize that. I actually thought that day-to-day, uh, that, that was still your thing. I mean, I, I can take this in so many directions. I, I wanted <laughs> to, uh, and we'll, we'll get back to the chess teaching because I am still super curious about that. Um, the early days, so you got you got contacted by by a guy on YouTube. I'm gonna tell you right now. I'm all, I, I'm sure you still get contacted about ideas, game analysis, saying happy birthday to my significant other. Do you ever get those? <laughs> yeah, I do. And um, <laughs> my strategy early on, although it's extremely flattering, I used to try to respond to like every single comment on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, for those who don't know my channel, I mean, I I feel like a small fish compared to Levy. I have. Yeah, uh, but- but come on. In the I, scheme of it, yes, I, I, I have a pretty large audience, like um, I think 180 some thousand YouTube subscribers. Um, but uh, yeah, I feel really lucky in the chess world to have that sort of reach. But I can't even imagine what it's like for you. I mean, in the early days, I tried to respond to every single comment like on my videos. But fortunately, I grew to a point where there was so much coming in every day, it became difficult. But um, I kind of figured out if I put my email address on my YouTube profile under the for business inquiries um, and didn't make it like so accessible, someone would have to jump through some, some hoops to try to contact me and they pr- probably really want to get in touch and might you know, have something uh, that I'm interested in as well or maybe some really cool story or heartfelt mes- message. I think making it a little tougher for people to contact you is like a smart idea. Yeah, I had to, I always had a business email which was just the regular one, uh, which I had on Twitter, and that's usually where people got in touch for brand deals or yeah, whatever. Uh, but it definitely did get flooded. And if I ever made the mistake of saying in a video, oh, someone sent me this game on my email. Oh my God, man, it was crazy. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, I went from, I'm a guy who likes zero as my inbox number. Yep. Uh, and it's like in the thousands. I just sort of left that inbox to die. Uh, and it's, it can, it can be very challenging to actually uncover legitimate things that I need to read. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that presents a challenge. Like with, um, submissions for like guests that Elo, do you, do you try to channel it into certain avenues uh, or a document somewhere like a Google doc? I know. I, I just made a completely separate email now from my YouTube channel. So people on YouTube contact a totally separate email and I have, uh, sometimes I'll post the, I'm trying to hire someone. I want to work with someone that goes to Gotham applications, uh, <laughs> I even made a, an email address that's just gibberish and I use it for bills. So now on, on anything that doesn't require a full name, I just put like LR or uh, my Uber name, like for the rideshare app used to be, uh, uh, it used to be Nidorf. I named myself Miguel <laughs> Nidorf. <laughs> Did you change it at some point? Or are you still rolling with Nidorf? No, so it's actually funny. I I had a lot of Spanish speaking drivers, and my name was Miguel Nidorf. So they would speak to me in Spanish, and I'd be like, "Oh uh. God, I, I," you know. So I had to change it to something American. So I, <laughs> they just wouldn't even dare, you know. Like, he only speaks English. I don't want to. 
uh, I don't want to talk to him. It, it was crazy. It was, um, but just little things like that. I don't know. I, I doubt, uh, I doubt you ever had any insane interactions with fans, uh, any crazy people, but you know, we all, we all have some small safety concerns. Uh, so. Yeah. I was actually watching one of your streams recently and you mentioned like the vast majority of your interactions. I think you said almost all your interactions with fans or people who know your content online, but meeting them in person has been positive. Yeah. And I've, I'm lucky to say the same thing. I mean, I haven't been to tournaments in about two years. Like I've been pretty inactive from the tournament scene, but just from going to so many tournaments and camps and stuff where chess players congregate and you meet chess players IRL, uh, it's, it's really a cool thing to see how positive the community is. And that is obviously reflected in the comments online, but you know how it is like every content creator, once they reach a certain size and even way before that gets negative comments and gets the, you know, the, the one tenth of 1% that's really just nasty and makes you question sometimes why you want to engage on a daily basis. Yeah. I, I've gone through different phases of this. Like my current issue is for a while, I was very good at identifying which people actually were really just hateful. Mm. And I would pin their comments uh, as a way to get other people involved. Just the people would be, we'd, it'd just be a laugh. You know, we'd have a collective laugh at an individual. The problem is that people got really good at pretending to be crazy. So we've sort of run its course now. Um, and then the community under that pinned comment would all write pin of shame. So then people started getting angry at those people. And they say, oh, you're just, you know, brigading and bullying someone. I'm like, this dude just said they hoped I die. They deserve this. Uh, come on. Uh, this is so this is the ongoing pin of shame meta that's evolving. Yes, it's a, it's a crazy meta, let me tell you. Uh, yeah, it's really tough because um, so every now and then I, I genuinely identify just, the, just not a good person. And it provides really good content. The other day I had a guy, uh, there was 300 responses to a comment and... This person who wrote the original comment was in there for two days straight. Maybe still, I stopped checking, arguing <laughs> with people. And, you know, that, 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 that was definitely fun. But, yes, uh, majority of interactions, super positive. Uh, I'm sure you, when you were playing or when you were anywhere, uh, people are just, I watch your videos, I watch this, I watch that. Uh, it's, um, it's amazing. And, yeah, I, I've always said, and I've like, sort of paid respects to the, to the OGs, uh, of YouTube because you guys were there when there was no Queen's Gambit, there was no Pog Champs, and it was, uh, I imagine it was just a, it was a totally different experience. I mean, you, your full timing as a chess teacher, that means private lessons and after school? Do you run like a, do you run a circuit of schools? What is the, what is the business? Yeah, so model? I mostly do one-on-one -on -one lessons. That's the vast majority of my teaching these days. Um, prior to the pandemic, I was teaching a bit in schools and, and doing camps as well, especially in the summer. But um, honestly, I did that stuff mainly because it wasn't necessarily the most uh, financially like savvy thing to do or making the most of your time, let's say. But I really love teaching in person. And I love in person chess too, which is a shame that I haven't played tournaments in a while because I think for all those out there who haven't experienced chess IRL, you got to make it a priority at some point. It just adds such a dimension to the game. Um, just the camaraderie aspect, you know, of like analyzing chess with your buddies or it doesn't even have to be your buddies, right? Like we've learned, I'm sure, tons from uh, random grandmasters or other title players over the years who've given us time and like said something maybe in the Skittles room after a game or in between rounds or something. Uh, yeah. So I do love the in-person aspect of the game and the improvement there. But yeah, most of my time these days is uh, kind of like this, just being on calls with students one-on-one -on -one lessons, um, some of the content creation stuff. But I guess I've always looked at Twitch and YouTube as just a, primarily a, a means of um, engaging with the chess community at large. And I made some money from it. That's great. But I kind of decided, I'd say relatively early into my YouTube chess career, if you will, that I wasn't going to try to pursue it as a primary means of income. Because um, I know the the daily content grind that goes along with that and how dedicated and pretty much how you have to make it a, a full-time job. It seems to me to, to rise to the top as uh, like you and Agad Mator, for instance, for example, have. Um, so that's worked out really well for me. I think for the type of content that I've produced, I tend to go more for the educational type content, some entertainment, but you know, if we want to break it down in terms of percentages, I would say like 75% educational, 25% entertainment, you know, maybe varying a little bit depending upon the video. 
But um, that's worked for me as a chess educator. And I love being able to say to a student, oh, yeah, I had a, a game or a video way back in 2016 where I analyzed this opening or I played a game in this line that you're now learning. Let me link it to you and you can take a look at it. But for you, your lessons are, are generally with intermediate and advanced students, right? You're not working with uh, total beginners. Correct. Yeah. That's uh, the, in the school programs yeah. that I used to work at, like pre, pre-COVID, that was something I did do, you know, teaching pure beginners and, and kids. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, the vast majority nowadays is uh, especially adult improvers. I'm, I work almost totally with adults now. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So not even, not even like a talented junior player trying to... Do you get messages from some of those families, you know, with the young, talented kid uh, and the parent is sort of managing everything and they're 2100 at age 10 or something? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And I think we're smiling because we know uh, often dealing with the parents is way more difficult than dealing with the kids themselves. <laughs> um, I think over yeah. time, for me, it's just evolved from teaching, yeah, like some talented juniors to now I have a couple like junior students who are, are quite promising, a couple of them. But uh, yeah, the vast majority of my inquiries for lessons have been from adults. It's just kind of gravitated that way over time. I think mostly because of the type of content that I have online where I don't think I'm capturing the younger demographic as much with my videos. So it's, it's mostly, yeah, like working age adults who are, who are watching my stuff. Was that a conscious decision from like a, a business and scale perspective from an early day for uh, like early days of teaching for you? Or is it just you're being yourself and naturally that's sort of the space that you carved out? Because I'll tell you, I started teaching in New York City and uh, when I was still in college and teaching in schools was kind of like the only thing that I, that I knew was available readily. Uh, and so I taught in schools for a while. I taught young kids. I hated it sometimes. It was really mm-hmm. awful, but it, it pays well in New York, right? Like in New York, I always say, even if you're 1200, you find the right after school program for one hour, knowing what they charge for a semester of that class, it, even a 1200 can get a hundred bucks just for an hour. And for sure, it's a terrible gig. It's an awful gig. You hate it, but you feel like a babysitter sometimes all the time, like 90% of the time. I mean, it, uh, unless, once the kids get to a certain level, the lesson is mostly about chess and the one-on-one definitely helps. But yeah, I used to, I mean, I was in classes where kids crapped their pants, <laughs> literally. <laughs> so that's sort of the natural path I followed. And with, with the content creation, I guess I, 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 I enjoyed the, the drinking a, a, a beer at 10 o'clock, playing some Blitz, talking a little crap and um, music and everything. And it sort of evolved into, uh, into a bigger thing for me only in 2020 when I saw it, I saw the wave coming, the first wave before Queen's Gambit. And I... I sort of just went with it. I kind of turned uh, what I didn't like about teaching very young kids, particularly on Zoom, because we all went into lockdown. I just turned that into being myself on the screen. And whether that was sarcasm, and it got me into trouble the first few months. Mm-hmm. I once made a snappy remark about coffee chess. They really didn't like that. I don't know if you know <laughs> about this. Um, Start beefing with random channels. <laughs> yeah, by accident. Like, I didn't even, you know, by ac- but that's just, I, sometimes I don't think before I speak, I'm, you know, I'm, when I started, I was like, yeah. shout out to coffee chess, by the way, they're great too. Yeah, they are great. I didn't mean <laughs> to, I didn't mean to, you know, get an army of people mad at me back in the day, but, uh, and it sort of just, it sort of grew and I rode that wave and I find myself, um, in a spot where it's, it's sort of also becoming now up to me what the next steps are for chess on the frontier, because I'm not riding the wave anymore. I've sort of like, I've caught up. Okay. I became maybe the largest channel subscribed, but now Every, the, the, the narrative is constantly, okay, chess might fall off at any moment. The hype is dying, blah, 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 you know, all, all this stuff. So for me, I guess it was, I try to consistently find opportunities within certain spaces. And if I had to adapt or, but, but at the end of the day, I, I guess I was in a way trying to be myself. So I'm, I'm, I am sort of wondering, was it a very conscious effort for you not to uh, be like, oh, this whole YouTube thing is kicking off right now. Like, let me, you know, let me jump in there. You just sort of were like, I, I really like what I do. I'm compensated in a way that I'm happy with. And um, yeah. this is the space that I'm going to be in. Yeah, I think it's definitely the latter for me. Um, I was always content being a teacher and kind of growing that aspect of um, my business. And really, ex- I think an extension of my personality and just what I'm most comfortable doing in the chess world. Um, you're right, though. I mean, Queen's Gambit, uh, Pog Champs, the whole pandemic chess boom, it was such a compelling opportunity. I think you rode that wave 
perfectly and you recognized it for what it was, which is like a massive opportunity, like once in a lifetime, I would say to grow in a extremely scalable, explosive way. And I think you have like the perfect personality to do that. And you've, um, you know, positioned yourself accordingly and, and reap the benefits deservedly. So, um, but yeah, I, I briefly thought like at the beginning of the pandemic, when I started seeing chess pick up steam, maybe I should produce more content. Uh, maybe I should try to change things up a little bit, but it kind of came back to what I had decided a couple of years earlier. I was talking about where I made a decision that I didn't like having the obligation to create content on a daily basis or keep up with the YouTube algorithm and sort of the daily grind of that. I tried to do that initially for the first couple of years, and I honestly found it to be pretty massively stressful having an audience that was used to you posting at a certain time of day even just on a daily basis, let's say, and feeling like that was handcuffing me a little bit. Um, so I, I guess I sacrificed some scalability for sure in mostly like working one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with people and occasionally producing content, but it provides a nice balance for me. And it's what I'm doing now is almost exactly what I envisioned doing as um, a chess professional when I was younger, when I made the decision 10 plus years ago to do chess full-time. Uh, certainly, I didn't anticipate chess blowing up the way it has and hopefully like sticking around or even like how, how leveraged you can be on YouTube and now Twitch and various platforms. I uh, had no idea I was going to co-found Chessable, but I've always kind of viewed myself as a chess educator. And that's even what I was doing way back in high school too, teaching and playing, but also uh, loving working with people too. Yeah, I, uh, I I feel the same exact emotions, but completely on the opposite uh, on the opposite subject. So it's pretty oh, funny that you said that. So that's interesting. I so I definitely I mean I completely agree uh, and echo what you said about uh, uploading all the time. So there has been I think one or two days in maybe five hundred days I did not upload a video. That's crazy. Uh, and uh, there are two, there are still like 10, 15 sticky notes right here, you know, uh, on my, on my desktop about the next video. I'm constantly, luckily Grand Prix starts tomorrow, right? You always have these benchmarks of tournaments, but if there's ever a barren environment, uh, or if there's three things going on at the same day, there was Battle of the Sexes and Tata Steel, and I wanted to do both. I just couldn't. I, I just couldn't. Uh, and I think when you played your last Norm tournament, that was right when Tata Steel was starting, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, and that, that, was, that was definitely rough. That's a whole nother ball game, uh, uploading your, your games. And in the US to do recaps when you have two games a day, it's, it's, a, horrible, it's a horrible thing. It really, and it catches up to you for sure. I think I'm, I am extremely tired uh, sometimes. Uh, today actually in particular, but yesterday I felt totally fine. So it's sort of- it's I'd sort love of, to circle back to that, by the way, at some point, because you know, we're both IMs and I've, try to do something similar in the past, like recapping my tournaments while they're mm -hmm. in progress. But uh, yeah, we should, we should return to that. At some no, point we can, briefly. we can jump on that on the, the very next thing. I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying like, that is a completely, it's a very serious emotion. There are days that Lucy and I will cut a hangout in uh, Manhattan a little bit short. We try to come home by four because I want to record a video. I feel really bad if there's a day I'm like, ah, I'm too tired. You know, I don't want to do it. Yeah. Um, YouTube is also a painful thing. If you don't upload for two days, your 48 hour views go down, everything goes down. It's really hard to kind of pick back up. I remember when Indonesia happened and I didn't upload for maybe a week because mm -hmm. my channels were getting brigaded. Uh, it was impossible. It took almost a full month to get all of it back into the algorithm. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very difficult. Um, and it's wild too, like the amount of videos that a, um, a very persistent content creator will create over time. Like I'm kind of, almost downplaying the amount of videos I've put out there. But if you had to guess, how many videos do you think I've made uh, in the course of my YouTube career? Oof. Feel free to ballpark, of course. Like, I wouldn't expect you to be anywhere close or even have looked anything up like that in the past. But uh, Well, can you tell me when you started and when you kind of sort of stopped? Yeah. I started in uh, late 2014. And I'd say the past couple of years I've been posting, but pretty sporadically. You know, we're talking once every two weeks or a month even. So about four or five years? Yeah, more. I'd say, yeah, uh, be, uh, being really active. Okay, uh, I'm going to say 1,000 videos. 1,600 videos, I think, last time I 1600, checked. 1,600, yeah. Yeah, roughly there, maybe even slightly more, which okay, is like crazy yeah. when I think about that. That is, I've uploaded 700, I think. Which is, wow. uh, yeah, which is, you've uploaded, um, 
Yeah, a lot, a lot more. I mean, chess base India, over six thousand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wild. And uh, I mean, Agad Mator probably two thousand plus. I would imagine. Yeah, two thousand plus. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. guys like Kings Crusher. Um, shout out to him. Also, Chess Explained, another OG. Those guys have a massive amount of videos too. It's chess really Network. like Chess Network. Yeah, yeah. One of the real OGs in the chess world. I mean, all these people we're listing have had so much um, volume come out on their channel over the years. And I, I do think for me that burned me out a little bit. Like I was posting three videos a day, Levy, when I started out on YouTube. I posted a bullet video, a blitz video, and a standard video. And wow. every day. And I did that for a few months until I was like, okay, this is a little too much. <laughs> but we do kind of benefit from not having to edit things as much as, uh, you know, chess content creators. So that's how I was able to do that. But I honestly think like that did burn me out a little bit on the YouTube game. And it it quickly put into perspective, I'm guessing, I'm saying overall, what I, what I thought was like healthy for me on YouTube in the long run. Yeah, for me on YouTube, I learned very early. I, I, I think I was just very good at researching what was missing and what needed to exist for the general audience. And then the combination of a really compelling title uh, and, and a good thumbnail. So from, you know, from even the very earliest days, I was paying people to make my thumbnails uh, cause that, that's really it. I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to. And it's not, it, it, it's called clickbait. It's just a word people like to throw out. We're in an era where you can just throw a word out on any subject and it's like a, got, got a bad connotation, but clickbait is basically, it's a compelling thing to click on. And if it delivers the content, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, if you're lying, if it's fraud, then it's a bad thing, uh, with the title or, you know, the thumbnail or whatever. Uh, Pretty basic YouTube marketing at this point, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, the thing is, it works. And, and I was actually, I, I saw a video just yesterday. I had no idea uh, that this was even um, a, a widespread thing, but there was times where I changed the title a couple times in the first 30 minutes because certain titles just do better. Certain words do better. Uh, and I was doing that for, for many, many months. Uh, I've gone back and like performed maintenance on old videos, re-monetized old videos, uh, because they were getting attraction. I mean, there was days I was just researching what keywords are hot with, nice. with chess, and uh, I, I found that really fun. I actually found the lessons part to be, it, it was actually stressing and, stressing and depressing me, and not to be, you <laughs> know, not to be Walt Frazier. Uh, but uh, yeah, like um, the pressure of knowing I have to show up to a private lesson and provide good content uh, and be accountable for like tournament results when I really didn't want to and I wasn't preparing for my lessons. At least with kids who are 800, you could teach them anything for years. They're going to learn something in the lesson. Uh, you know, but it got to a point where it was tactics, practice games, analysis. And right. Uh, yeah, so I, I, that's what I was saying. I sort of, I'm, I'm totally on the opposite end. Like if I have to put in uh, effort, uh, and, uh, and, and stress or whatever, I, I wanted to do it on the digital side of things. So it's just, it's interesting, but um, yeah, I mean, you've approached it in the right way too. I think you need that level of detail and, you know, obsessively searching keywords, looking back at old videos, like, man, the amount of times I've looked back at an old video to see how it's, it's been doing is minimal, probably could count it on one hand. <laughs> so yeah, that's, I think a huge difference between you and the vast majority of content creators. Like you need that level of persistence and uh, commitment to optimizing your channel, let's say, to really like rise to the top. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I would never, I would never publish a course on like digital brand w scale. I don't know, you know, keywords, some big keywords that sort of indicate that stuff. There is a market for that. People definitely sell courses on uh, building your, your brand or whatever, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, it it's a it's a process i mean there were like you said three videos a day i remember back in the day my first video i'd record at seven in the morning or uh you know i'd wake up i would drink coffee i would stream eight to one and then i would record a video in the afternoon to post that evening and at 10 o'clock i would come back to my computer to record a another video that would come out at 7 a.m the next morning so <laughs> um i actually recently was re-watching my a video on where i analyzed the games of the queen's gambit like the seven best games of the Queen's Gambit series and the actual games played on screen. And I try to tell the audience historically what game that was. That video I had to re-render at four in the morning. Mm. Like I remember watching it and I just, like Lucy was fast asleep 
And I'm just out there like a crackhead at <laughs> the, the dawn of night, you know, with a with a jaw that was malfunctioning because bleary eyed, clicking buttons, like okay, I gotta yeah, yeah, re-render yeah. this video. I looked like I was on drugs because I also had a bad drilling in my tooth, so my jaw uh, was shifting all over the place. I mean, I just look and I just look back at that, like man, nobody knows. Like it's really, it's it's um, it's a totally separate grind. But I guess um, I feel the mo like of all the projects I get involved in in chess. I feel perhaps the way you're describing about uh, chessable courses I've created in the past. Oh, yeah. Because I kind of view that as like evergreen content that people are paying, you know, sometimes quite a bit of money from in the case of some pretty like comprehensive courses. Uh, like I did, of course, 100 end games, you must know, where yep. I legitimately worked on that thing for three months straight. And I think I did something like 2,000 plus takes for all of the videos that were synthesized into a 19 hour video course. And I wanted to know the material, like absolutely cold of these hundred theoretically most important end games. And are you that's kind of how I operate. I was going to say, are you happy with what you made on the course after I'm all happy with what okay. I made? Yeah. And uh, the proof is, is in the comments. Like I'm very, the, pr the thing I'm most proud of, I don't think there's been a single comment saying, John, like you missed something in this variation you talked about, or that's wrong. What you, you, what you, what you described. Cause yeah, you know, it's end games. There's nowhere to hide. Everything is known. These are all table-based positions where they're solved. Yeah. And um, I wanted to make sure I knew that cold because I knew this would be something that never changes. And I wanted to put a great product out there that I could recommend wholeheartedly to someone. Those are the types of things that like get me to rise to my best, I think, in the content creation world. It's also, it's funny. I, when I, when you say that, I think of things like it's probably why other than just being a better chess player, uh, you have a hundred plus points on me, uh, even <laughs> though we unfortunately hold the same title as we transition back to that subject we wanted to talk about. I, one of <laughs> my IMs in the chess world, yes. Well, the, the, reason I, the reason I draw this comparison, I hope this makes sense, is uh, the, the attention to, to detail, like the, um, the, like the painstaking effort it, it takes to actually put out just a really like, perfect piece of work, uh, YouTube actually kills that side of things if you're not putting out a science video, for example. Uh, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of science creators. I'm sure their facts have to be all like a thousand percent true uh, and, and, and super, super verified. But sometimes, even in my own recordings, because I'm one taking, I make mm. mistakes. Like I, I, I really do. And I blunder things. And, and, and I just, I, I don't even notice sometimes when, I, when I'm recording, people catch it after and I'm like, oops. Or a final move of, of some variation is played and it's actually super complicated. I totally should have elaborated, but <laughs> that, that feeling you get when you're like deep into the line, and you're like, I actually didn't understand why this variation works. Yeah. But or, I thought I understood. In fact, once I get here, it's not clear at all. I'll give you an example. Um, have, did you follow the Tata steel games? Yeah. So Jordan's last move against Anish rook H three. Okay. Um, yep. it, it hangs a rook in one move like Bishop uh -huh. takes rook. But his whole idea was that he can push the pawn and the queen goes, like, it's a brilliant sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I didn't even notice it until the video recording was done. Like, I just didn't even, it didn't even occur to me. And I'm so fascinated by these top players who can commentate with such precision. And everything is super precise and they're still calculating. I've gotten so lazy on some of these things. And the problem is my courses, as good as they are, appeal to an audience to a certain point. And if you're a 2,000 rated player, Chessable is a much better option because you're getting stuff from Anish Giri, who had worked months on a course, versus, versus Gotham, who might have put in, okay, I don't know, 20, 30 hours researching, putting it all together, recording it. But um, I might be advocating a gambit sideline, which at the end of the day is not like a viable, you know, permanent opening repertoire. It's not a lifetime opening repertoire. It could get you a 70% win rate if you study it well and know all the lines, but um, it's, it's a different product it's a different you know if i'm right. teaching someone the vienna gambit you can equalize with black in the vienna gambit instantly at a certain level i'm not appealing to that level i'm appealing to a little bit more of like a this is a little bit easier thing to learn a little bit easier thing to understand and people st it, it's still successful but then there's a whole argument to be had well you know should you be learning the vienna gambit as a 1200 well i gained 300 points i really love the opening it was super easy to learn then you could have a whole meta argument should you have learned the italian <laughs> instead I don't know. I mean, you can That's feel free. <laughs> kind of nice thing with digital resources though, right? Like you can cater to what your audience is. Like your audience doesn't require, you know, I know you have GMs who watch you, but largely they don't require like lengthy theoretical analyses of lines that run 20 plus moves deep. And even in like the lifetime repertoires on Chessable, 
I think for the most part, many people are using those as references, like a very comprehensive high level reference, where even though the course might have 1500 lines, they mostly know they're, they might use uh, 10% of those if they're lucky over the course of the next few years yep. in their chess development. Um, but yeah, I think there is something to be said for like practical courses, like the ones you're creating. Uh, on Chessable, it's been popular now to do like a quick starter chapter, which I think is kind of similar, where you try to get up and running um, with the essential lines in a course that kind of present the meat of it and go from there, which, yeah, I mean, especially with the time controls people play online these days, that's for the most part all they need, you know, until they reach a certain level and then they can get into the nitty gritty details. Yeah, it's definitely a an interesting debate and folks will... They have asked me to make a move trainer uh, chessable version of, of, of one of the courses. And, and I always kind of say, I feel strange sharing a website with Wesley So's E4 56 hours of video for part one. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, come on, this is a PhD thesis and, 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 and uh, SAT practice uh, kind of in, in, in the same place. Um, but uh, that is the nice thing about chessable, though, that there's content for everyone and uh, non-title players have made wildly successful courses. And I um, lost to one of them. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, I played uh, in St. Louis. I had no idea. So I, it was one of the evening games, just one one game for the day. And I was playing against a guy from St. Louis who actually watches some of my videos. I had no idea. I saw him in the comment section once. So shout out to Julian. I played Julian Proleko. And, um, oh, yeah. I was like, okay, he's going to play Nim, so I'll play something he would have never prepared. You know, I'm going to prepare one very small thing. I don't, I have 18 hours to prepare. I'm going to over prepare. Let me just relax. Let me. Um, I prepared some main lines in G3 Nimso. He just blitzes out some shit I've never seen in my life. Literally, have never seen in my <laughs> life. And uh, I have to play very critically to get a 0 0.2 advantage. Um, I don't. I'm much worse on like move 15, and I lose with white. I. I, and then know, you asked I, him, like, hey, where'd you learn that line? Where'd you pick that up? No, I was very sad. I didn't want to talk to him after the game. It had nothing to do with him. I was just very, I was like, come on. Like, what? what? So um, I was sad, and I went to get some food. So I'm sorry, uh -huh. Julian. But, uh, yeah, I, um, I was told afterward that 2100-rated uh, player apparently made a course on that variation using Leela. <laughs> and just, like, what the hell, man? I mean, John, it used to be so easy. I could learn a sideline, play it four times, two wins, two draws. Retire the sideline. It, you just can't do it anymore. It, it's, uh, yeah, so there's, there is a lot of that stuff. For I've sure. been really impressed by a lot of the untitled players who've embraced that sort of work in chess and like aren't afraid to try to produce something of value for the chess community, despite like not having a couple letters in front of their name, you know? And I think there's been some really phenomenal authors and creators who've emerged that like are embracing the fact that they can learn with the engine and Yep. If they know how to interpret the engine correctly, can often do stuff like that. There's a one particular person I think who I saw were, was an anonymous opening assistant to two GMs, rated like two thousand. I think their username was something like Chess Opening something. I don't know, mm. but um, they had a few few free courses. Uh, I, I I I I look through them sometimes. I uh, I'm still um, Move Trainer doesn't cut it for me. I'm not trying to you know, disparage sure. the, the yeah. product or anything like that. But I, I, I've tried with, um, I'm super dinosaur, and I think most title players are. Download the file, PGN, <laughs> you dig through it with chess base. That's just sort of, I mean, how we do it. Uh, yeah. The database and, you know, your, your Leela or your... Which I wonder if the younger generation is going to continue to use chess base or are they going to no. move more towards... You don't think so? I think, um, I think they love the concept of forced repetition uh i i can't i could never wrap my head around it because my, my i just felt like i was wasting my time i felt like i needed to study a little bit of the lines and i would never methodically just sorry mechanically remember everything but they do i mean it's yeah. like crazy they really do i saw a kid in also st louis 40 moves blitzed out and then lost <laughs> but okay he lost but you know he blitzed out 38 moves of theory. It was impressive nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, I was standing like, why does he have 140 on the clock, you know, in a 90-minute in a yeah. game, gain 10 minutes? Um, but I'm kind of the same way. Like, I still use ChessBase to organize the vast majority yeah. of my opening files because I'm used to working through their databases. But, I mean, Lee, the Lee Chess study tool pretty much does, like, everything essential that ChessBase does for, for most people. It's yep. another option. I mean, there's so many tools out there, which is why whenever people get... Um, 
very deterministic and kind of territorial about online chess resources like, oh, you know, chess.com, Lee Chess, what's, you got to choose one, you know? I mean, why? There's, <laughs> we have uh, an open internet for a reason and well, are fully you, um, exploit all those tools, everyone. Uh, I, what I always say is the people that use Lee Chess are kind of like vegans. <laughs> That's sort of the analogy <laughs> that I've made. Um, you know, they got to let everyone know what they're doing and they got to try to convert you. It's one of those situations. I, I would uh, have to disagree with that a little bit, but okay, I can see why, you know, you may be, Really? You've, uh, you've seen that online. Okay. Well, pr uh, why do you disagree? I think that might be the refrain on like our chess. The, yeah, the chess okay. subreddit, yeah, yeah, by yeah, the way, because yeah, yeah. like yeah. chess.com bad, Lee Chess good. That's become a meme. <laughs> but aside from that, like, is Fair, that really yeah. the case? That is, um, um, no. I think that's, that's, the, to that's the audience that I'm, it's, it's the only place on the internet that I can see hundreds of comments about a subject in the same place but you're right it is very much an echo chamber uh so i think most people if they prefer one or the other aren't out spreading gospel to convert yeah, and you know else. from my own students uh the vast majority i'd say 90 percent of students i have actively use both sites uh 90 yeah. might be a little high some might clearly but at least they have an account on both sites and they've used, used both of them at various times yeah that's no, they don't use Chess Cube. No fix. <laughs> <laughs> no Yahoo Chess. I still yeah. stream on IC. You played on ICC back in the day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've definitely seen those uh, those ICC streams. Um, mm -hmm. I I fire it up every once in a while for uh, for the nostalgia. I, I yeah, I remember even watching Naradiski. I think back in the day, but I I uh, I was in the first wave of um, I think Chess.com. It's really when. Um, uh, when when I started playing more online, uh, when Chess.com it felt had like ten people, including GM Joey One, who oh, yeah, <laughs> a legend. <laughs> yeah, you played him. You had the whole country watching. They would talk trash in the chat. It was a crazy period of time. Uh, I'm I don't even rem I remember almost none of my accounts. I mean, I sometimes I would do the the Theodoru. I would play on an account for two weeks and delete it, and play on an account <laughs> for two weeks and delete it. Um, so he he has. I had like a funny moment a couple years ago where mm -hmm. I was working with a new student who was young kid. Um, and, uh, we were doing the lesson on chess.com. We we're going to use the analysis board on chess.com to conduct the lesson. And, uh, he had sent me his username. So I knew his username. I was looking up his games in advance. First thing he says to me when we get on the call, he's, uh, he's like, Mr. Bartholomew, your, your chess.com account is older than I am. <laughs> Cause you can see person's join date on there. And I joined in 2009 <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, I really have been on, uh, the chess internet this long. Yeah, I saw something, uh, man, I forgot who, who this game uh, was played by, but recently in a top event, um, there was a comment that said, Jordan Van Forest was not even born when his opponent played that opening already. <laughs> I mean, like, they, like he played into, I th maybe it was against Shirov, I, I don't remember, but he it was like the first time that his opponent played that opening, Jordan wasn't even born yet, and now here Jordan is playing it against him. And, um yeah, for me personally, it used to be shocking when I would look at the FIDE rating list and see the birth year was like 2000 or later mm -hmm. for some of these top junior players. And now if you were born 2000, 2001, I mean, you're not exactly like a, young, a spring chicken anymore in the chess world. No, no. Now it's like 2009. <laughs> yeah, it's just insane. I, I, like I said, this tournament in St. Louis, I played the first, second and fifth ranked 11 year old in the country. Um, That's I actually, I had some good games against them, but the, the last one, yeah, the last one got me, uh, even though I was, I was doing well, but I was, I almost finished the gauntlet. Um, but all of them are just unbelievable. Yeah. I yeah and they, they, a lot of them play without fear too. That's one big thing I've noticed about that. The younger demographic, maybe it's cause they played a lot of us title players online and they're used to it. But, uh, I mean, I remember when I was a kid playing an IM or a GM was like a very big thing. And I was like, I don't know when I'm going to get an opportunity like that again. So I was extremely nervous. I don't get that sense of fear from the younger generation. No, no, definitely not. We, we said maybe 30 minutes ago we were going to go back to that subject, but it would be fun yeah. to talk to you about uh, tournament chess. Um, For sure, yeah. Yeah, you, your peak, you have two GM norms, one? I have one GM norm, yeah. When did you get it? Uh, St. Louis 2013. It was a Spice norm Cup? tournament, round robin. Oh, at the yeah, club? At the, at the club, yep. So one of those that they organized. Oh, wow. I didn't realize they were organizing them. That, and it was already like Sinkfield and everything. It was... Um... Yep. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yep. They had started um, probably actively doing that a few years prior. 
I want to say St. Louis really got started with their big time tournaments, like 2009 ish, maybe, maybe 2010. So yeah, yeah the club had been right. humming right along at that point. And, uh, the way I got the norm was pretty much purely by happenstance. Like I didn't necessarily prepare for this, um, round Robin tournament that much. Okay. But I started off hot. I started off with, um, I think five out of six actually. That's that's pretty hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I won like three games in a row, I think from rounds like four to six. And round four, I played Grandmaster Anatoly Bykovsky, is a Israeli Grandmaster. Yep. And I was I was plus one at that point. So I won my first game through the next two. Play this guy in round four. And I was totally busted at some point in the game. And I ended up turning it around and winning the game. And that's how you know. That's how that's how you know you have the touch. Yeah, like, and I think that's honestly uh, when people make norms, like they will often point to at least one moment, probably more like two or three, where something like that happened, where the stars just aligned. Yeah, I had five I, out of six, and then I could just I made three draws after that and got six and a half out of nine. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 perfect. I was I'm not distracted. I'm I was trying to pull up the the thing here on like uh, one of the websites, but I, I unfortunately couldn't. But uh, that is usually, yeah, that, that's usually how it goes. Like you, you can have some good prep, you can have a good game, but you need luck. And, uh, I think all of my IM norms were closer to GM norm performances than IM norm. So they were like maybe 25, 50, oh, but really? yeah, so you overperformed yeah. by a yeah, significant I, amount. I mean the, but it, it's weird because now for whatever reason, and like I said, it, it could be just the fact that that streaming and YouTube and this entire thing just. It, it kills the part of you that's able to sit and just study like slowly, methodically, with good discipline. Um, that could be it. But I've all, yeah, I think I've also noticed that um, in my last uh, several tournaments, I'm just, I don't know, like I'm not, my I'm not, head is not screwed on straight for calculation and also just, just like mentally physical energy is just not there at and all. And man, it makes total sense. Uh, I think the amount of effort that your YouTube grind takes just that alone. I know you have other stuff, your courses, uh, streaming on Twitch, all your other obligations. I mean, I couldn't really imagine doing all that and trying to compete for norms. That might be it. That might be it. But unfortunately, we'll never know because there's no, uh, yeah, I can't, do, you know, I can't just go away for, uh, for some months and, and, and only study. I think a part of me would sort of die. But uh, uh, you're still very young. I mean, you might change things up with your model at some point, free maybe. up time. But um I mean, for you, this was the, the this was a norm, but I, I imagine you had close runs as well, and you were also, I mean, you were twenty four seventy seven. So, I am curious about that whole journey because I, I will say when people talk about IMs that are good for GM status and ask for all the streamers' opinions, <laughs> uh, your name is is there. Uh, it's probably at the top of the list. I mean, you won the I am not a GM speeches championship. It wasn't close. Um, yeah, the first edition, maybe they'll, they'll do another one coming up, uh, third edition, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, it's interesting. I, um, I feel really flattered when people say that, but at the same time, I feel like I haven't got close to, um, making an effort to reach my chest potential. Maybe you feel the same way too, but I feel like I put in honestly, probably about 10% of the true effort needed to attain like mastery in a subject like chess. If I really want to attempt to attempt to reach my maximum potential, which uh, the problem is it's diminishing returns, right? Like that's always the big issue, certainly financially. Like you don't pursue Grandmaster to earn more money. That's nope. for sure. And it's a, it's a massive time investment, uh, the, to say nothing of the emotional ups and downs, all the traveling involved. So yeah, I, I decided in, I believe 2017 to take some time off from teaching and some of my other obligations to make another push for it. And I did play for about uh, maybe four or five months. I played a series of tournaments, nine round tournaments. Um, I played in Norway a couple events. That was a lot of fun. Um, played a number of these round robin tournaments. I got close to a norm at a tournament in Charlotte, one of the round robin tournaments, mm -hmm. which I know you played. And it was the final round. I was playing I am David Brodsky. And I needed to win to fulfill the norm requirement. I think it was right. six and a half. I was on five and a half. And I needed to win with the black pieces. Uh, we got into a very complicated Richter Rouser classical Sicilian. I got exactly the type of unbalanced position I wanted. We played all the way down to a rook end game in mutual time pressure. And I was looking at two moves. I was looking at rook f1 or rook f2 in a given position. And I was pretty much playing on the increment. 
So uh, for those who don't know, that means like you're down to your uh, last 30 seconds, which is usually the increment and um, trying to make a good decision between these two. And I more or less like flipped a coin in my head and you can guess which move I played. <laughs> I played the wrong one and the game ended up being a draw. And it was just absolutely heartbreaking to see afterwards. Of course, the first thing I did is look it up on, on my, pull my laptop out after the game was over, went downstairs in the club, sat in a corner and looked at Stockfish and yep, Stockfish confirmed, confirmed the other Rook move was winning. And that was such like a heartbreaking moment, <laughs> you know, needless to say. Um, that the entire tournament for me, like in my mind, basically came down to that move, even though really it's probably never just one move, one decision. But um, that was sort of the last time, like I seriously competed for norms and it wasn't even so much because of that tournament, but I just wasn't willing to make the massive time investment over a period of many months or even more than a year with an uncertain outcome. You know, I think right. that's a big thing in the chess world, right? Like if you're pursuing norms, it's not like attaining a, higher level degree or something where you know it's going to be challenging and time consuming, but there's like a finite amount of time it's going to take. It's that uncertainty. Yeah, it's a terrifying, it's a terrifying thing, uh, for sure. And, and in, in, in some ways, I also don't think I'm helped by the fact that I can go to this tournament. For me, it's almost like the uncertainty doesn't, it, it's not there. I, I'm coming back, it's the same thing. The only thing that's affected is my rating. I mean, you make one video saying you're upset about your games and you move on. Or you make mm -hmm. one video celebrating and you sort of move on. It, I almost felt more of a pressure to kind of work and then perform because I did the same. I took time off teaching at some point, I don't remember, 2016 to get the I Am Norms. Um, I was a late bloomer. I was 2200 when I was 19. Uh, I like barely competed and um, 2016 was like a huge year. I ended it at 2404 with two norms. And Did you play a ton at the Marshall, by the way, when you were younger, kind of up and coming? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. I mean, when I was a kid. Because um, I'm pretty sure I remember like seeing your name in cross tables, like constantly in, in Marshall tournaments and not yeah. really knowing who you were. I kind of just lumped you in mentally as, oh, this is like a New York guy. Like he's always playing at the Marshall in NYC. Yeah, I I wasn't the kid who had like a dad or a mom come with him to the club every week. It was sort of like I was into chess. My parents were supportive because it wasn't narcotics. <laughs> <laughs> I was addicted to something good. Uh, and if if I didn't want to play anymore because I was mad or I didn't want to work, then I wouldn't play anymore. And I went through a few of those phases. And I played a lot my freshman year of college. Like I played in the Monday night event at 7 p.m., which was called Fide Mondays. And I, uh, it was really funny. I just had my small little gauntlet of openings. I had, uh, you know, Trumpowski. I played some, some Londons. Back when it, there was, it was cutting edge, you know, to play something. <laughs> you, would get a, you would get a book, and that book would serve you for like two years. What uh, are those things, books? There's actually books with oh uh, printed God, chess I, positions in them? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's nuts. Like, Mind-blowing. <laughs> um, I remember really like enjoying reading them too. Now I can't even imagine. I can barely read any book now with my attention span. Do you read? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I have a read? ton of chess books too. I have probably 300 chess books. Most of them are in storage at my parents' place now, but uh, I love chess books. I haven't bought any in recent years. Uh, I'm sad to say, but I got to get back to doing that. That's what I'm saying. In recent years, more. in recent years, have you been reading or no? Not chess so much. No. Uh, you read, you I, I got to say regular? I've been a little... Yeah, yeah. I, I got an Audible account this, uh, this past year, so I've been doing a lot of audio audiobooks, and I like nonfiction. I like motivational type stuff, business books. Um, but yeah, I used to read a lot more chess books than I, I have been in the past few years. See, yeah, that's another thing. I, I, I want to read more, and uh, when I read, I get tired. Mm. I, I like legitimately, I, it, it's incredible. Um, but you do need some discipline, I think, uh, and... Uh, for a while, I was reading 15, 30 minutes before sleep because it would actually just tire me out and I'd be, <laughs> it, would, it, would help, it would help sleep. But yeah, chess books back in the day, I mean, and, and I was just playing at the Marshall and um, this all kind of ties back to the fact that, that now it's actually, it, it's extremely difficult for me to, to um, find time during the day to just be like, okay, I'm going to work on my chess. Yeah. That's it. Everybody, that's it. Two hours, I'm going to just study. And the days I do, again, I just, I just get so tired. Um, but I also find myself caring way more than I should. So I, I have to work on that as well. Um, 
my practice games, if I play, you know, for three, four hours of blitz, I get so frustrated if I'm putting in the work to get better, but it's just not happening. It's just, you know, like I'm still losing, I'm still blundering, I'm still not converting positions from the opening, and uh, but that's that's just me. Oh, yeah, I get the sense IMs in our position trying to push for Grandmaster probably need two to three hours of real deliberate practice on average per day to make a push for Grandmaster. Might even be upwards of three to five, depending upon kind of yeah. where you're at in the journey. But I'd say like two to three of like actual deliberate, you know, no filler, no like, oh, I'm going to play some Blitz games and that's going to count as my, my effort for the day on chess. I feel yeah. like that's probably needed, which is obviously super tough to make time for. And the thing is, a lot of it is good preparation, but for example, you're, you're a, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you have always struck me as a guy who just gets a position out of, you know, 10, 15 moves. You kind of know your, you know, your openings well enough. Obviously, you're 2460, 2450 IM, you know, 28, 2900 blitz, and then you just play. Yeah. Um, you're not looking for move 18 idea you saw a week ago, blah, 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 uh, d deep prep, and then you have to convert. Like, I've always kind of liked that. I really like the prep. I really like to get my, uh, to imbalance position, not playing into what my opponent likes to play. But then it comes to calculation and it comes to instinct. And uh, that's why I have my rating, you know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm very curious to know, like, your, your, your thoughts on playing style, I mean, calculation, yeah, all this stuff. Yeah, no, I've, openings, I think, have been some of my biggest weak, weak points in um, recent years, especially as I've started, like, consistently hitting my head against the wall against, you know, 2,500 to 2,600 opposition in particular. They just do everything a little bit better than someone at my rating range. Um, you know, uh, a 2450 IM, let's say, where their opening prep's a little bit better, their time management's a little bit better, they calculate a little bit better, their end games, they have more knowledge. Um, so I think I would need to bring all that up, probably especially openings and calculation for me. My opening repertoire, my openings are stable, but I'm just not on top of all the developments I need to be to, I see, I mean, I see the opening trends and I see how these younger players play in particular. and they're following like all the games coming out of Tata Steel, even in the challengers section, you know, and following all the new developments, what lines people are playing. I mean, I saw a line, some line in the Nightorf the other day that just blew my mind that it was even playable. It was a Bishop G5 Nightorf, mm -hmm. and then Black plays Knight BD7 in reply, and then White played Bishop E3. Just retreated the Bishop to E3, like apparently losing a tempo, but that's a valid idea for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Where was this game played? I, I think it was in the challenger section at oh uh, Tata Steel. Not, I did not see that. <laughs> yeah, so like, there's just stuff like that that I know a lot of the hungry players, especially the young ones, are constantly following, and I'm just like, not right now. Wow. I have absolutely no clue. Um, wow. I'm, I'm like, I want to I go click and find this after the, um, <laughs> yeah. the episode is over. I, I, it, it probably ended in a draw because I, I always try to look at like decisive games. And if I think it, it was a draw. Yeah. I, that usually I'm like, oh, okay, if it's draw, maybe I'll look, maybe not. But if it was decisive, I always take a look. Uh, it's kind of like in the night or the, this uh, trend a couple of years ago, if you were playing knight B3 for mm -hmm. white on move six or H4, it just yeah. moves that look completely nonsensical. But there was actually like a very specific idea a lot of times attached to them uh lucas van forest played like a bishop d2 i think oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i guess uh, in the mainline knight of position the lesson is pretty much anything's playable <laughs> yeah i think literally there's um 15 or 16 moves there if if that might that might be too much but i remember counting once and just being absolutely flabbergasted uh or what mama Diara played i mean that's probably uh the most compelling example against esopenko right early g4 yeah, um, Bela Sene or uh, Bela Sene from, uh, from Algeria played G4 in a Nimso and also G4 in a Queen's Gambit decline move five, like with Bishop nice. on E7. Um, he played G4 and he won both games in, nice. the, ba in the Battle of the Sexes. Yeah. He's dedicated. Uh, I like that. Yeah, I try to play some of that stuff in Blitz and it just doesn't, uh, yeah, it just, it just doesn't work. It just, <laughs> Yeah. For me, for me, it just doesn't work. Um, yeah, I think centrally, like, you and I, we're kind of, we're, we're immersed in chess constantly. Obviously, we do chess full-time. But in terms of, like, attaining mastery in chess, we are not immersing ourselves right now. No. You know, we're kind of, like, dipping our toes in. Yeah, if you prep for a tournament, play a tournament, you, you feel like you're engaged in that, uh, maybe even a clo close to 
during the time that that tournament's going. But the real hungry players, the ones coming up, um, you know, these young IMs who tour the world looking for norms, it's, it's just 100%, 100% commitment, 24-7, 365. Yeah. There's something really fun about it. Just every day, being um, learning, practicing, and actually improving. Uh, there's very few feelings better than just actually getting better at chess. Like the, all the work we put in, just feeling, you know, having a good tournament. Uh, it's it, it's having it's just, something to come together for one game, and you just feel really proud of what you created. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like I look back, I had a couple of games where the prep was good. The guy played a move that was not in my notes, and I just destroyed him. And I felt it was just, oh my God. I mean, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to celebrate. And my nerves were good because everything was good. There was no need to even be nervous. Uh, but like time management and all that. Um, but the truth is that, yeah, it's just really not practical to live a lifestyle where all you do is just study chess. That's, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, it, I, it, I was going to mention, I do have an idea for you. Not that you need another idea oh boy. in terms of how to manage, uh, your time during a tournament. But again, like having been there, like maybe I have a slightly different perspective, but I think if you were to play a tournament, norm tournament where it's two rounds per day again, and you want to cover the content. You'll probably end up doing it the way that you have done. Uh, but if you could find someone, a friend that you're, you'd entrust with your channel for that period of time um, and have an agreement with them that they're going to cover the analysis of your tournament games. And after your game, you're literally just going to call them and like dictate to them for five, 10 minutes, your thoughts. And maybe they can include that, maybe even the audio of the call, but really just relay your thoughts to your audience and basically have it be known that this person is going to be your stand in covering uh, your event for that tournament, that might be the best possible compromise. I know it's very difficult. You're, you're compromising somewhere on something, <laughs> especially with your face not being in front of the camera during the I event. Know. I, but that I, I think like a del that level of delegation, in addition to other tasks that you delegate, like thumbnails and whatnot, that's probably the key step, in my opinion. That would be feasible if I had friends. <laughs> <laughs> so my... My issue is that oftentimes my two chess friends would probably be playing in the tournament. So, mm. uh, like uh, Alex. So the Ostrowski. very small list of people you'd entrust with something like that. Yeah, my other two friends don't play chess. I have, you know, I have several close friends, and two and half of them don't don't play chess at all. Um, you could hire Eric Rosen maybe to do it. I that actually is I was just about to say you were Eric yeah. Rosen, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like what really I think would help. Uh, is is uh, travel to a nice destination, be with Lucy, uh, and have a game one game a day. Exactly. So, yeah, I was gonna bring that up too. One game. I mean, two games a day is it's uh, it, it's it's really bad. And also, um, I th I mean I think I think the last tournament that I played that was the worst tournament of my life. I also the the, the worst I ever felt. I don't know if you've you had a tournament where you it, you lost a ton of games. You don't really f seem like a guy who would lose a ton of games. You ever? Well, had a I had a tournament like that. Actually, one of the most recent norm tournaments it was a while ago now. But I started with uh, half out of five. Lost my first two games. Drew the third one. Thankfully, felt like such a relief when I drew that game, and then promptly lost two more. How'd so, you feel after the fifth round? Oh, I mean, I was ready with for the tournament to be over after round two, pretty much, because it was a norm tournament. You know, you lose two games. Where? Obviously, this is in Minnesota. Yeah, it was, Minnesota. Uh, a tournament that um, Andrew Tang's father actually organized. So he's organized some norm tournaments in the past year. Alex, my friend, played in one, I think. He, oh, he yeah. Played. Yeah, I think he did. That's right. Did he play? Were you there? He was not there. I think he played the next year after I played that tournament. Okay. So I don't think you ever played each other. I think he, he missed Actually, playing. he's beaten me before. He beat me at a tournament in um, St. Louis, maybe back in 2016-ish, 2017. Uh, yeah. The sack on B7. Mm -hmm. yeah he yeah. sacked the pawn on b7 yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. i remember yeah, he, he played a great game there he uh he, i remember back when he was competing he would share some openings with me and i'd be like oh wow and then he played it against you and i was like uh it, it, it worked perfectly um yeah i was like what the heck is this like is this a legit sack and it actually was pretty difficult and i lost <laughs> that, that's, I, I don't remember the opening nothing i just remember there was a and i remember no other games but yeah there's like some little little things uh, i i recall but i mean that feeling half out of five yeah. Like for for me, when, when in in this most recent uh, event, when I when I had, I think I had one one point um, out of five. Like I, I I first of all, I didn't want to play, so I, I just didn't want to play anymore. Like it's not even about. I mean, I I and I thought that if I showed up, I was gonna lose. There was no way I could change. Like mm. there was 
So what did you feel when you were showing up for round six? Was it just like, I'm good enough to win this game? Or was it, because for me, yeah, all of that I, was I think gone. it was just going through the motions. You know, I wasn't in it mentally. Um, I was still capable of producing fine decisions, but my heart wasn't in it. That's for sure. And it, I think it wasn't after uh, the second round, honestly, which it sucks to say that because you got so many other rounds to play. But, you know, I, I often feel like um, losing chess games, especially multiple games or having a, a bad tournament, it's, it's kind of the same effect of like, they always say if you lose money on an investment or you gain money on an investment, like the gain, it isn't as good as uh, the loss is painful, right? Yeah. And I think it's a factor of like two or two and a half X, the, the size loss versus the size gain. It could be an equal size loss or gain, but the loss is going to hurt about, let's say minimum twice as much. And for chess, I found that to be the case in uh, once you've reached a certain level, um, and you're trying to make like an inch of progress in one direction, like at maybe the rating level I'm at right now, I feel that way. Sometimes I'm trying to make an inch of progress and it can be immediately erased by a couple games. And I might not have a chance to play more games like that for another month or something. If I'm even playing chess actively. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think, um, the only reason I started playing so much was because I had a decent tournament in Vegas. I played like one really nice game and then I, I, I won my last round of Charlotte, but I had some fighting games there and, and I gained 18 points in two tournaments. And then I was kind of more or less balanced the first seven rounds of the next one. And I the two losses in rounds eight and nine, which is just like the worst time to lose against players who are not even, they're lower rated than me. I lost all the points. So 27 <laughs> games, but 25 of them I was plus 18 and two of them I was minus 18. Yeah, it's and, so easy uh, to, to, to lose it all back. And I mean, yeah. this has been a tough period for over the board chess too, just because of all the massively underrated players who didn't play during the pandemic, especially the kids. I still yep. feel like a lot of times they're, I mean, I looked at the games of a student who played in an under 2200 section uh, out in Vegas, I think. Um, and these games, every round, he didn't quite manage a plus score, I think, but every round I felt like the play was at a 23 or a 2400 level. And this is an under 2200 section. Yep. And I asked him, I'm like, are your opponents like kids? Are they like, underrated you think he's like yeah they were all kids <laughs> and that's happening a lot lately yeah there a guy ran into me in vegas uh at a at the starbucks downstairs you ever play in vegas yeah you know the starbucks line like in is the this West national Bay? open or uh yeah, national North american open. open no national open i think when i played it it was probably a different hotel oh but is it uh is it the rio is that the hotel no it's it's the Westgate. Westgate. okay yeah i definitely never played there Okay, there's a little lobby downstairs, like the only place to get breakfast because the casino. Mm. Uh, and the guy ran into me, was talking to me about the channel, and I told him I don't play Trumpowski anymore because you can't really get an advantage with white. And he said he pulled out like a file that was on his phone, completely analyzed by Stockfish. <laughs> and he started debating with me why I thought that black was okay. In the, in, and I was like, well, you know, bishop g5, d5. He was like, okay, knight d2. I was like, c5. He was like, all right, bishop takes f6. He just started... This was like a 1900. Yeah. And, and he gained 100 points that tournament. So that shows you, you know, he's probably 300 points stronger than he already is. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that guy was just... Uh, he blew my mind because it's not the only person who's like that. He was rated 1875, but probably has the knowledge of a 22, 2300. Right. Uh, uh, it's, it's a... Yeah, it's it is really wild. I completely agree. Obviously, the <laughs> investment or chess, you go up, you get a little happy. Um, yup. And uh, I mean, it, it, there's different timelines. You know, you beat Brodsky, you probably get a third norm in the next six months. It's yeah, right. Of... Yeah, there's alternate timelines where maybe uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily lamenting uh, certain games that I played in my tournament past. And you know, the, the truth is, honestly, like my OTB career, I've been really fortunate to um have had like some amazing results best result i ever had i think was when i won the national high school tournament when i was a freshman in high school with a 7-0 score i mean playing over the board has in introduced like so many opportunities into my life um i went to U university of texas at dallas on a chess slash academic scholarship and i quote unquote won the scholarship you still had to apply for it and, you know fulfill the academic requirements but I got that scholarship from winning the national junior high championship the year prior when I was in eighth grade. So, you know, nobody out there should be discouraged from this conversation Levy and I are having at oh, no. you know, a fairly high level 
about we, you know, I think both of us greatly appreciate all the experience we've accumulated in the, you know, the times we've had over the board and chess and we'll continue to have, but it's a little bit different now when you're kind of just looking at the nitty gritty of points. Like if you're playing for a title or trying to achieve something, it's just the raw math and who you're up against. Uh, it's a different game. Yeah, I'm actually at the level I can play in the I am norm section and not even get an I am norm, but still gain like 20 points. So I, <laughs> I, I very much look forward to it. They might invite my... you as the, you know, a player to play in an I am section. I am. Section. I, I'm playing in, um, in New York. Uh, the, oh, the nice. Next... Okay. I'm actually like the fourth or fifth highest rated. It's unbelievable. Uh, so <laughs> I, told, I told Alex, I was like, I'm only playing if I'm playing in the I am section and you don't invite some 11 year olds who are obviously going to be GMs in two years. <laughs> so we have one player who fits that criteria right now. Um, Yan Ruyang. I actually coached her at World uh -huh. Cadet. And she's almost my rating now. This has been an ongoing narrative in your videos. I've noticed, Levy. Like, I coached this player in China and like Beijing back in. And now, and now they're like X yeah. rating. <laughs> yeah. And now they've come to collect old man. Um, right, right. <laughs> yeah, luckily I only coached uh, three kids uh, in, in China, but yeah, I played one. I didn't coach him, but I actually have a photo with him like at the last day uh, in China. Uh, he was torturing me for a while. That was unbelievable. I couldn't out-calculate like, him at all. The whole game, I'm like, oh, I out-calculate. Wait a minute. It's just an ongoing thing. Yeah, calculation, practical calculation, so important. Like to spend totally. two, two to five minutes on just a transformation in the position or pushing the position in the right direction. It's just, it's just so important. Um, so yeah, much that ties into time management too, yeah. which uh, some of these, these players who are active, like um, the guy you played, Nico Theodoru, I played him in a blitz match on chess.com the other day. I got absolutely smashed. Um, we played 10 games. I managed three draws and seven losses. Didn't win a single game. And just every game, I felt like I could hang with him to some degree with the decision-making, mm -hmm. but the speed at which he was firing out objectively just good moves. Yep. He was arriving to those moves two, three times faster than I was. Yep, yep, yep. I, I don't play guys like him. They just demoralize me. <laughs> um, I actually was, inc I was just shocked. Uh, you played a match against Kalars. I just cannot yeah. beat that mofo ever. He, <laughs> he's like, he's, he, he is kind of like Eric Hansen when I, from, those guys are my kryptonite because they're better in the opening, better in the middle game, better in the end game, and like faster. It's just. Yeah, yeah. So I was just amazed. You pulled off like some wins in a row. I think you tied the match against him or yeah. close. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Like you could walk away for a week and be happy with that result. I mean, me, I'd be like, totally. Oh I went plus one against Kovalenko the other day on four games. I think, you know, two wins, one loss, one draw. And I was like super happy because he's like close to 2,700 feet. Eh? But yep. then again, like there's untitled players who've easily beaten me in matches recently. So it goes both ways in chess, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, uh... It's true. Sometimes um, you, you have like a really good result. Um, it happens in Title Tuesday, actually, like a uh, very, very similar thing we've been describing. You win like a good game in round three versus some, some opponent or round four, and then you just hang out uh, like uh, over there. Like I've had tournaments, yeah. you know, I beat a GM, I beat V Pranav, who's like 3,000. I draw Komsky, and then in round <laughs> 10, I lose to a 2,500. Right. Yeah, exactly. Brings you back down to earth quickly. <laughs> oh, so yeah, really, really quickly. Um, I know you said. Um, We've got about maybe 10, 15 more minutes. I, yeah, to be honest, yeah, that's perfect. I, uh, I'm very curious about some of this stuff. Um, so I hope, I hope you'll, you'll excuse me. Oh, for uh, sure. Yeah. I hope this has been interesting for the audience too. Uh, I feel like we've only scratched the, the surface of possible topics to talk about. So um, happy yeah, to we, discuss anything further. Maybe I'll have to come back sometime too. Yeah. I'm getting to the point I want to invite uh, repeat guests. Just for whatever, you know, if some something going on in the in the chess world. Um, nice. I actually was gonna ask you things uh, th things outside of it. Like for example, uh, you are known as you know the guy. You, like I feel like you have a chess kingdom in Minnesota. You're just known <laughs> as like the. So are you born and raised? Are yeah, you just... yeah, born and raised uh, in the Twin Cities. I live in Minneapolis now, uh, and What's we've the... got a good little chess scene around here. We really do. It's it's pretty nice. You have like a chess. There's a chess club and. Yeah, there's a place called the Chess Castle. It's uh, the main club in the entire state, really like um, the most active club by far in the state. Uh, Wesley So lives here. He lives about 20 minutes away, 25 minutes away from where I live. Oh, wow. Uh, so that's really cool having, you know, a top how, 10 player in the world there. How did, he, how did that happen? Did you convince Yeah, so him? he has connections to a local family um, that he kind of fostered when he was in St. Louis. And he started communicating with them and he decided to eventually move here. And uh, yeah, he's... He set up shop here. He has roots here, and 
it's wow. really cool. He used to come to tournaments every once in a while, like, you know, pre pre COVID pre pandemic, um, maybe even still does from time to time. And, uh, he's really supported the local players in the pro chess league. Um, we used to have a team, the Minnesota blizzard. Yeah. Um, Andrew Tang is he's yep. my most successful student I've ever had. He's penguin GM one online. If any, any of you guys know him, they know him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they, they do. Yeah. Amazing blitz and bullet player. He's got some insane videos. Uh, check out the video where he plays a tile game. It's not even chess. It's like a game where you click tiles. Is that Osu? Is that what that's called? I, I don't remember was... the name of it, but uh, it was one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen, um, especially as like a largely non-gamer myself. <laughs> I know His what you're talking about. Yeah. Insane. So yeah, he's in the area. He, he's in uh, college as well. Um, but yeah, he's in the area. We have a couple other title players too. Uh, Sean Nagel, uh, Sam Rugnarianen, great young player. Who just um i think he played in one of the sections at your tournament actually oh sam sam rugas from from over there i had yeah, no idea yeah he's local yep wow so for a midwest that. state where typically there isn't a whole lot of chess stuff going on we we kind of lucked out here in minnesota did um I'm, I'm very curious how how it like i cannot even imagine what it, it looks like i mean is it's, it's probably more suburban than than big than a big city right uh so yeah definitely car, Yep, and Driving. I don't know if you know this, but I actually used to live in New York for uh, one year at the beginning of my chess career. Um, I, had, I had no idea. Where'd you live? I was on the Upper East Side from uh, 2011 to 2012, and that's oh, how I got my start in chess. I, I quit law school, and I moved uh, from Denver back home here to the Twin Cities, but then very quickly to NYC, and I was living with um, international master Dimitri Schneider. Oh, yeah, um, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know Dimitri. I mean, not not personally, but we've yeah we've talked. Um, yeah, who's back in chess now? He was a uh, he was working in banking for a long time, but he's actually the uh, the Chessable. CFO of Play Magnus. Yes. Oh yeah, Play Magnus. Yeah yeah. So yeah. he's back, and I was living with another chess player, um, Andre Zaremba, who's a FIDE master. Um, and neither of them were in chess, but I was out there at the time, uh, in the you know cutting my teeth on chess teaching, doing a lot of in person stuff. So all that's to say, yeah, a little bit different than New York. Uh, for sure. I live like at a fairly busy part of the city, but I mean, it's nothing compared to NYC and you, you can posted, drive you, 10 you minutes and get out to farmland pretty much. You posted a photo recently, like a nightly walk in Minnesota. And I was like, I can't post photos like this <laughs> because, uh, or unless I'm already gone from that location, it's like, I, I worry about stuff like that. Um, I was like, I feel like you just posted a street corner of 10,000 places in, uh, over there, you know, like, <laughs> right. it's just yeah. some snow and, um, but, uh, how how is it so is it possible to have uh kind of like um like a social scene if you're so involved in chess because i figured not a lot of people are so when you hang out with folks is it it's probably not chess world right is it people from school? oh yeah yeah I'm, I'm lucky i have a good set of friends around here uh especially buddies i've known all the way back since elementary school a lot okay, of times yeah, yeah yeah um actually like minnesota has a way of drawing people back because you know, <laughs> i've lived a few different places i mentioned like Texas, I went to school down there. Yeah, law school in Denver, NYC. But um, I always had a feeling like I might come back, and I eventually did. And our state has a way of, of doing that. So I'm really lucky to have like a good set of friends. My parents live uh, about 20 minutes from where I'm at. Um, I have a brother who lives in Washington, D.C., but otherwise, yeah, a lot of friends and family around here. Yeah, that is, that is definitely very nice. It's probably the only thing that's kept me around here. <laughs> um, it, it, it admittedly is, it's tough to leave like for the right place. But even then you, you feel, you know, you feel, you feel homesick. You feel like uh, certain stuff is, uh, is missing out. Yeah. Um, that's a big decision. I know you've hinted at, you know, maybe you and Lucy moving somewhere, but um, yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of factors involved, right? Especially family. Yeah. Family, everything. We, we were really set on Austin for a little while. We kept hearing good things. We went to visit and we hated it. Like we mm. literally hate it. I've never bumped a flight up a day. <laughs> Have you ever been like, to Austin? I get it. Uh, I've been there once, but it was a while ago and I wasn't there for very long. Yeah, if it was a while ago, it was, I don't know. It was probably completely different. But even now, I mean, everything is, we were even thinking because, um, you know, how, how, house prices go up three, 4% every year. Uh, in Austin, they go up 30% every year. Wow. So we Huge were like- Huge influx of people. Yeah, like maybe we get a house, you know, but we moved, we're like- we are not living here. No way. Just, I don't know. It's just, I don't, just, uh, and now their power grid might fail again. So, mm. um, yeah, I, I don't know if you have those kinds of problems in, um, 
in Minnesota, but isn't it cold? You like the cold? It is cold. Yeah. I'm looking at my thermometer right now and it's five degrees Fahrenheit right now. And it was right around zero earlier with like minus 20 wind chill. So yeah, like you take the good with the bad, you know, certainly I'm not a big winter sports person. Like there's a lot of people who are fans of the winter weather skiing, and and skiing ice skating, yeah. uh, hockey culture is huge out here. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's probably our most like successful sport, if you will, because our other sports are not so great. Although my Timberwolves are doing pretty well in the NBA this year, but, um, Oh, they're yeah, doing you know, really it's... well. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. They're, John they're... Morant is a B. Oh wait, no, no, that's Memphis. Hey, <laughs> right. Oops. Grizzlies. Oops. Okay. Uh, never mind. We have, we have Anthony Edwards. He's, uh, he's kind of our young explosive guy. That's the guy who's going to save the franchise or else Carl Anthony Towns was going to leave. Right. Yeah. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Hopefully. And they're so young. They're all, you know, average age is probably like 24, 25 on that team. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I like it around here a lot, but um, I could definitely see my myself living somewhere else. I don't know that I would go back to a coast in the U.S. Um, kind of spent my time on the East Coast, and I like it out there, but I feel a little more at home around here for sure. What um, what the, what does that consist of? I wonder. Just quiet, just kind of like I was trying to find why we didn't like Austin so much. Mm. And I, and I, and I didn't know, I mean, we kind of, we didn't, we weren't crazy about downtown. We weren't crazy about, uh, the suburbs. We just sort of drove through the suburbs, but yeah. So I, I, I am curious what, what would you prefer in a lifestyle if you, if you didn't like a coast? I, I honestly, I just want to, I just want to hear it just so I can kind of like the certain yeah, things to think about. Yeah, it's a great question. I think maybe there's a, a, more of a balance and it's just not as high density, right? Like. I can, for my current place, I can like walk to a lot of cool bars and restaurants and there's a big social scene. Uh, there's lakes, as you saw in those pictures that I can easily get to. Um, but also I can drive 10 to 20 minutes and be out in like the country basically, or go somewhere really scenic where there's no people. And it's super seamless. I can get to the airport real fast too, which is major international airport, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, we have a really good like art scene, ton of breweries around here. Um, yeah, pretty much all the major sports traffic. I mean, traffic's a big one. I live living in Dallas. That's actually one of the big things I disliked mm. Dallas. The Metroplex is massive. I felt like it was like four Minneapolis, St. Paul's on top of one another and just huge highways. Yeah. And I know there are parts of the U S in particular that are just way worse than that when it comes to traffic. I mean, Houston to speak nothing of LA for instance. So to me, like stuff like that really matters. Um, can I, go about my day-to-day -day life and not feel like the frustration of being near too many people and feeling like a sardine. Uh, but also enjoying, you know, I, I go to the coffee shop every morning, uh, mostly to get out and like be around people, especially in COVID times. Like I want to, I want to get a little so social interaction within reason, but um, you know, not too much and like, you know, be able to do my stuff, but not feel like I'm walking through crowded streets or crowded buildings all the time. Are you in a, apartment or house yeah house. yep i'm in an apartment oh do, do you but you own it you bought a condo or uh... so I, I used to have a townhome and i sold that last uh summer and then moved i i was in the suburbs previously of the twin cities and then i moved into uh minneapolis itself into an apartment okay i see um but you, you're, which you're was a bit of a lifestyle change, but it's been a good one, yeah. I was gonna say because I remember you you had a ch big chess piece behind you, and then recently I popped into a stream and I was like, wait a minute. Oh yeah, it's it's still there somewhere. Um, oh, but it looks <laughs> it, it, it's definitely a different setup. Yeah, um, it's got it's got a Santa hat on it, but <laughs> yeah, different setup totally. Because um, for me, I I figured out I don't like driving places day to day if I don't have to. Mm. So around here, I don't have to drive much, which again is like a nice. NYC aspect, big city aspect. Yeah. But uh, I have the option to, if I need to get somewhere, go visit my parents or something. Yeah, that's, I think, one thing we really hated about the, su the, the, the suburb feel in, in Austin. But even, even the downtown, uh, I don't know, we, we weren't, it seemed like they just sort of slapped some apartment buildings into a place and it seemed a little bit walkable, but mm. Yeah, we couldn't. Uh, but that 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 is a very yeah that that's a very big thing I think for us. That's what we realized. If we don't need to get into a car, we really don't want to. Um, totally. And that's what I've heard about Dallas. It's a pain to drive. I mean, driving in New York City, it has a bad reputation, but it's so slow. It's so <laughs> it's like fifteen miles an hour, and uh, you know people are switching lanes very fast. But uh, that's yeah, good that you and Lucy are like 
making a concerted effort to check out places you might move to though. Cause you, you, there's really no replacement for that. I mean, you could look endlessly online and say, Oh, like this looks good in theory. Yep. But you got to experience it for yourself. Yeah. The next place we're, we're going to check out is either Miami or Fort Lauderdale, at least turn mm -hmm. it into a vacation. Couldn't really turn Austin into a vacation, but at least there's a, <laughs> beach, there's a, there's a beach in Florida. Nice. Um, maybe we'll stop by, uh, Minnesota one day. It's I, yeah, I, was in, yeah. I was in the airport once. I drank beer in the airport with my friend Kyron Griffith. So shout out <laughs> yeah. to Kyron. Um, yeah, you have to roll through sometime. I know it's uh, well. Speaking of which, because we we only got like two three minutes. What's uh, what's what's on the future? Is it? Uh, do you have any big plans, or is it just more of the same? Like uh, pandemic no, I almost lifestyle? felt embarrassed. Like when you uh, you kindly asked me to come on the podcast because I was like, I guess I, I'm I'm happy to, but I don't have anything. A lot. I feel like a lot of people have something in the pipeline they're talking about. <laughs> that they're doing and i'm kind of doing my usual stuff i'm considering if i want to play tournaments again i kind of have my eye on the reykjavik open coming up in april i might play um i'm always considering if i want to write another chessable course or post more on youtube but i'm honestly just really content where i'm at teaching and um you know making content for the chess community when i can uh, i feel really lucky i feel really fortunate to work in chess and be in this time period where technology allows us to reach more people in the chess world do you are you still actively accepting students is that a thing yeah, uh, yeah oh. i am yep all right well people you heard the man um i <laughs> I, uh, I i always pushed uh, i used to get requests for for lessons uh, i've pushed a few few lessons to my friends um i i, I cool. would be willing to bet from this podcast you would get some hit ups so hopefully hopefully it's folks that uh, know your worth aren't gonna try to get some well, free, I, free analysis from you or something, but, um, I appreciate, I'd say, uh, for those of you out there who want to know a little bit more about my content, check out my chess fundamentals series, um, yeah. maybe climbing the rating ladder as well. It's on my YouTube channel and that gives you a good idea kind of of my style. You had a great um, series name. I couldn't, I couldn't like, I couldn't, uh, think of one back in the day because <laughs> rating ladder is just so good. You know, I can't, uh, I, I, I do a lot of research even on small, smaller YouTube channels, like right now who have maybe 20, 30,000, um, subs and i sometimes i see really good ideas and i i'd never steal them because like i i know i i could completely take that idea that has ten thousand views and turn it into this huge thing i always try to think of ways i can maybe incorporate elements but i never i hate that stuff i, I don't want to become somebody like that so yeah it's um, good you're doing the legwork to make it unique yeah i like always try to just but sometimes you just can't and i'm like oh, you know what they got a good idea there's nothing i can do here um but yeah like crowdsourcing uh that kind of stuff is um, is really fun. So it it is very fun to when people reach out with a really cool idea. Um, one guy reached out to me. I feel bad. I got to get back to him. But an anti puzzle website. So oh nice. Like, okay. Is this is this a puzzle? Is there a tactic here? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Find it. No. Okay. You're correct. Or uh, nice. So stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I uh, I've never recorded an episode of a podcast on Thursday, so it's Thursday. So this will be out tomorrow, actually. Oh, perfect. Okay, <laughs> cool. Quick turnaround time. Yeah, I usually it's usually a couple of weeks, um, and uh, yeah, you know we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll just keep keep chugging along, and I might uh, I might think of some content and get you get you involved. Maybe we do some who knows sub battle something. Yeah, yeah, something that'd be fun. And uh, like I said, whenever uh, you want to have me back on, I'd love to come back on. So. Again, I feel like we could talk for a long time about various... There's always something going on in the chess world, right? So there's no shortage of topics to discuss. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, if there's... Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have you back. Um, I feel like with, in this conversation, obviously we're, we're wrapping up right now, but um, sometimes with like you or Eric could go for like three, four hours. We could full Joe Rogan it. Uh, that's a controversial guy, actually. Uh, <laughs> we could, you know... Oh, whatever, I'll, I'll keep that in. Um, yeah, anyway. yeah, it's good to talk to you because I don't think we've ever spoken in person. Um, I, I don't even know if we've seen each other at tournaments before, maybe once or twice in the past, but, um, this is the first time we've had an extended conversation. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. There are some people in the, in the chess world, we just kind of coexist, but we know that if we like linked up, you know, it would be, uh, it'd be cool. Uh, and we, for sure. we would have, uh, we're just like you and Eric Rosen, uh, very different, maybe personality wise than myself. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I guess it's like, it's like, it's like yin, yin and yang. I, I'll, I will sign off with that. Do you think that you are the most wholesome and nice person in chess or Eric <laughs> who wins? Well, you know, the wholesome response, I can't judge my own wholesomeness. Yeah, so yeah, that's true. You know, right. bo if both Eric and I would defer to one another. So that's, that's just how it has to be. Yeah. And then you got me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a shit star. Um, actually I just had one last, one, one last quick thing. Would you sure. ever do chess boxing? 
you know, I've thought about that before. Um, I'm interested, but being 35, I'm kind of getting, uh, you know, long in the tooth a little bit. I've, I've torn both my ACLs, Levy, playing basketball. So my oh, footwork may not be the best, oh, wow. but I, I am interested. I'm interested. I like the concept. Okay. Well, I don't have absolutely any idea of a chess boxing event, but I did want to know. Uh, some, some people are uh, on board. Some people aren't. But Got it. Um, cool. Yeah, John, it was a, it was a pleasure. So Likewise, thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. Thanks again to all your viewers. Once again, folks, if you've made it this far in the episode, I just want to thank you for all of your support on my main channel uh, and the podcast as well. If you'd like to support me, you know where to find me. I'm on Twitch. I'm on YouTube. Uh, and I have some chess courses at GothamChess.com. Till next time, I'll see you right back here in Gotham City with our next guest.